Right, well, it's two o'clock and um, we're still waiting for a couple of people to join, but we're mostly all here now. So um, I'm going to start. Um, I, I, I know a lot of you, but for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Kim Sammons and I'm the conference secretary for the Joseph Conrad Society UK. And um, I would very much like to welcome you and thank you all for coming along to the first in this series of um, St. Mary's University and uh, Joseph Conrad um, Society UK lectures. Um, and I'm delighted to um, present Professor Robert Hampson, who is delivering our first lecture. Um, I'm sure many of you already know Robert and he goes without introduction, but I'm going to do one anyway. Um, Robert and um, Professor Robert Hampson is a research fellow at the Institute for English Studies um, at the University of London. He's also Professor Emeritus at Royal Holloway University of London and a visiting professor at the University of Northumbria. Robert is the author of three critical monographs on Conrad, Joseph Conrad's Betrayal and Identity, Cross-Cultural Encounters in Conrad's Malay Fiction, and Conrad's Secrets, and most recently, a short critical biography simply named Joseph Conrad. He's co-edited Conrad and Theory, Conrad's and Language, and the forthcoming volume, The European Reception of Joseph Conrad. He's the author of numerous essays and articles on Conrad, and has edited Heart of Darkness, Lord Jim, and Victory, The Penguin, and Nostromo, and the Lingard Trilogy for Wordsworth. He's also currently the chair of the Joseph Conrad Society UK. So without ado, I'm going to pass over to Robert now and um, we shall begin. Uh, thank you very much, Kim. I want to do two things in this lecture. I want to discuss Conrad in Africa. Um, that's after all the title. And I want to consider what Conrad means to us today, which is the kind of larger ish question raised by this series. Uh, to address the second question first, I want to begin by raising another question, and that is what the name Joseph Conrad signifies. Over the last couple of years, I've been involved in editing a substantial volume of essays on Conrad's reception across Europe, across almost all the European countries, alphabetically from Bulgaria and Czechoslovakia to Slovenia and Ukraine. What's clear from this project is that Joseph Conrad means different things at different times in different places. At the simplest level, this is a matter of which works are published. In this case, which works are translated and when they're translated. A variety of factors play into the decision to publish or not to publish a particular text. And these factors include how the text seems to speak to contemporary concerns in the host culture, or how the text fits with or seems to fit with contemporary political imperatives. In Italy in the 1930s, for example, Mussolini's brother planned to bring out a complete edition of Conrad's works because of Conrad's perceived emphasis on duty and service. In the post-war period in Italy, on the other hand, Conrad was promoted by young communists like Italo Calvino for his opposition to colonialism. Sorry, I've just lost. Um, there is then the additional question of how the selected works are actually translated. In Spain, for example, during the Franco period, translations of Conrad's Malay short stories were tweaked to make them less critical of colonialists and bring them in line with Catholicism. Once the chosen works have been translated, the next issue is how they're marketed. Conrad has been presented in different countries and at different times as a writer of sea stories, as a writer of adventure stories, as a writer of boys' books, as an important modernist writer, as a leading figure in world literature, and particularly after Chinua Achebe's essay and after Apocalypse Now as the author of Heart of Darkness. There is then the question of which works are reviewed and how they're reviewed and then how they're received by readers. In Germany during the Hitler period, for example, Conrad's works were read as a form of liberal humanist resistance to fascism. In Poland during World War II, Lord Jim was an important text for members of the Polish Home Army. In the USA, according to the FBI, the secret agent was read by the Unabomber Ted Kaczynski to justify a bombing campaign against advanced technology. This is perhaps a rather long-winded way of saying, as I said at the outset, that the meaning of the term Joseph Conrad is not stable, but shifts according to time, place, and culture. 
The reception of Conrad in England has also gone through successive changes. In his own lifetime, after the publication of his first novels, Mayor's Folly and Now Castle Island, he was initially seen as a writer of colonial fiction like Kipling and was praised for annexing Malaysia for English literature. After the publication of his short stories Typhoon and The End of the Tether and the novella The Narcissus, he was seen as a writer of sea stories. And indeed, at one stage, he was so frustrated by this, he wrote of his desire to get freed from that infernal tale of ships and that obsession with his sea life that he complained had only a limited bearing on his literary existence. Conrad's work was immediately well received in literary circles in England in the, in the 1890s, but he had to wait until the publication of Chance in 1914 to receive popular success, as most of us know. Interest in his work slumped in the, in the UK after his death in 1924. It began to revive in the 1940s with Muriel Bradbrook's Joseph Conrad, Poland's English Genius of 1941, and F.R. Leibniz's The Great Tradition of 1948. Bradbrook presented Conrad as a transnational writer who brought a migrant's critical cosmopolitanism to bear on contemporary politics. Leavis presented Conrad as one of the four great English novelists who changed the possibilities of the art of the novel and whose novels are significant in terms of that human awareness that they promote. Bradbrook's Conrad was the Conrad of Prince Roman, the Rover, under Western eyes. Leavis's influential volume established the Conrad canon for the next 30 years, at least in the UK. It's a canon that begins with Heart of Darkness, Typhoon and Lord Jim as minor works, and then presented Nostromo, The Secret Agent, Under Western Eyes and Victory as Conrad's major works. In Leavis's account, the cosmopolitan Pole, student of the French masters, becomes an English moralist concerned with what do men find to live for, what kinds of motive force or radical attitude can give life meaning, direction, coherence. However, Conrad is not presented by Leavis as a didactic writer, but rather as an artist whose artistry works through irony, through patterning, and through an interplay of contrasting moral perspectives. This brings me then back to the question, why read Conrad today? Inevitably, this question, why read Conrad, raises a prior question, which is, who is the reader? For me, as someone who spent a lifetime reading novels, and for whom novel reading has been my business, the first answer to the question, why read Conrad, has to be the sheer quality of Conrad's writing. By that, I mean his ability to craft sentences, paragraphs, chapters, stories, and novels. From his reading of Flaubert and Maupassant, he derived the aesthetic idea of le mot juste, that is, finding exactly the right word for what he wanted to present to the reader. Every word has been carefully pondered and has, has a purpose. And we can see something of this, for example, if we pay close attention to the opening sentences of Nostromo and the kind of information that they contain. Another part of this aesthetic for the novel was the importance of cadence. Conrad's labor over his texts was in part directed by his attention to the rhythm of his sentences. Conrad's prose should really be read out loud in order to appreciate this. It's to me very striking how many poets have been drawn to Conrad, either as critics, translators, or in their practice as poets. That is, for some readers, there's a pleasure to be derived from reading Conrad purely at the level of his handling of language. Related to this is his technical skills as a novelist. From the start of his writing career, we see a powerful creative intelligence exploring the form of the novel and the form of the short story. We observe this, for example, in his handling, adaptation, and transformation of various genres of the novel, the adventure story, the sea story, the detective story. He was taken up by André Gide and other French novelists and critics, for example, for the model he provided of an action-based fiction that had psychological, political, and philosophical depths. We can see this creative intelligence also at work in his exploration of different methods of narration, from his early occasional uses of, of omniscient narration, through his use of various narrators, to his subtle use of what's called free and direct speech, that is where the narrative is presented or focalized through the perspective of one or more characters. His best known narrator is Charles Marlowe, who first appeared in a short story Youth and then reappeared in Heart of Darkness, Lord Jim, and Chance. In Youth, Heart of Darkness, and Chance, Marlowe is the principal narrator, but he's not what is called the primary narrator. He's introduced by another unnamed character within a specific storytelling situation. Marlowe is thus doubly distanced from Conrad, and his attempt to understand his own experiences, or those of Courts or of Flora de Barrel, for example, are presented as the self-explorations of a specific character or as his own fiction-making attempts to understand another person. In the case of Lord Jim, the novel begins with an omniscient narrator 
who reveals things to the reader about Jim that Marlowe never knows, though the bulk of the novel is then taken up by Marlowe's attempt to understand Jim, or possibly by his refusal to fully understand Jim's case. Conrad's exploration of the form of the novel has meant that his work has been taken up by other novelists. I've already mentioned André Gide, who translated Conrad's story Typhoon, took charge of the first edition of Conrad in French, and was inspired by Heart of Darkness to go to Africa, and then to produce his own African works. In Germany, Thomas Mann promoted Conrad's work in the 1920s and 30s. Lothar Gunther Buchheim's 1973 novel Das Boot reworked Conrad's victory. And Christa Wolff's 1987 novel Störfall, Accident, drew on Heart of Darkness. In Italy, Cesare Pavese and Italo Calvino promoted Conrad's work through translations and critical articles. In Poland, Jacek Dukai has recently drawn on Heart of Darkness in his novel Ice. In Spain, Javier Marias translated Conrad's Mirror of the Sea and draws on the secret agent and underwestern eyes in his recent spy novel, Berta Isla. In South America, Nostromo had an impact on Gabriel García Márquez's 100 Years of Solitude, and Conrad's work was much admired by Borges and Mario Vargas Llosa. This range, I think, suggests something of Conrad's vital presence in world literature in the 20th century. And then we come to the subjects that Conrad deals with and his ways of dealing with them. From what I said a moment ago, we can see that one element in Conrad's fiction is psychological exploration. However, Conrad's engagement with complex dynamics within the self and between the self and others always takes place within a critical understanding of the social context. If part of darkness involves a descent into the self on the part of Marlowe, then that descent into the self is contextualized as that of a 19th century English sea captain who's experienced the horrors of Leopold's exploitation of the Congo and its people, who has seen for himself the gap between the rhetoric of the civilizing mission promoted by politicians and circulated by the newspapers, the gap between that rhetoric and the reality on the ground. This returns us then to something I drew attention to earlier, namely Conrad's interest in history and politics. His early work set in the Malay archipelago, among other things, provided a unique record of the trade, politics and culture of the region. As a result, they've been used by historians of 19th century Southeast Asia for what they reveal about the cultures of the region. In these novels and short stories, Conrad provides a thick description of some of the different cultures of the archipelago, the Bugis and Sulu in particular, and their interaction with English traders and Dutch colonizers. With his middle period works like The Secret Agent and Under Western Eyes, Conrad situates his narratives within the cities of London, St. Petersburg and Geneva. The Secret Agent revolves around the historical event of the apparent attempted bombing of the Greenwich Observatory in 1894, but uses this incident to explore the policing of London and the contemporary issue of immigration. Under Western Eyes similarly takes off from an historical event, the 1904 assassination of Depleva, the Russian Minister of the Interior, and the Tsar's right-hand man. In both these cases, Conrad was responding to relatively recent political events. What Conrad offers the reader then is a fiction that is informed by his historical and political interests, that engages in subtle and profound psychological explorations, and is driven by an ethical concern that is not didactic, but is comfortable with uncertainties. Indeed, there's a deep skepticism in his work that constantly challenges the reader. And that kind of unsettling, I think, is important to us today, living in a constantly changing world. This afternoon, I want to focus on the lesser known of Conrad's two African stories, the short story and our post of progress. This was written in July 1896 when the Conrads were on their honeymoon in Brittany and published in the magazine Cosmopolis in June and July 1897. By comparison, Heart of Darkness was begun two years later in December 1898 and finished in February 1899. In his 1919 author's notes to Tales of Unrest, the collection in which an outpost of progress was included, Conrad described an outpost of progress as the lightest part of the loot that he carried off from Central Africa. What I hope to show this afternoon is how that statement has perhaps led to an underestimation of this short story. I want to cite other statements at this stage as evidence of a more favorable or more positive judgment of the story on Conrad's part. The first is a short note Conrad wrote in 1906 when an outpost of progress was republished in Grand Magazine. The note was headed, my best story and why I think so. And obviously he's going to say it's his best story in this context, but I'll disregard that for a moment. 
The elements he singles out for praise are the scrupulous unity of tone, which he aimed at when writing the story, and the well-remembered severity of discipline to which he subjected himself. The difficulty, not because of what I had to write, he says, but what I had firmly made up my mind not to write into it. What he left out is perhaps suggested by the letter he wrote to Fisher Unwin, the publisher of Cosmopolis, the magazine in which now Post of Progress appeared. He wrote to Unwin in late July 1896, shortly after he'd finished the story, to tell him something about the story he was going to send him. Perhaps the most interesting part of this letter is his reflection on the process of writing. He says, all the bitterness of those days, all my puzzled wonder as to the meaning of all I saw, all my indignation at masquerading philanthropy, have been with me again while I wrote. This bitterness and indignation are what he felt he had to subject to that severity of discipline in order to achieve his artistic purpose. And this then obviously raises the question, what was his artistic purpose? I hope to have answered that question by the end of this lecture. For now, I want to note that he faced a similar problem later when writing about anarchists and the secret agent and Russian revolutionaries and under Western eyes. In the secret agent, as in an outpost of progress, one of the devices he used as part of that discipline was a sustained ironic tone. In Underwesternized, by comparison, one of the devices he used was to have an elderly English language teacher as his narrator, a man whose nationality and limited knowledge of Russians created the distance Conrad needed for subject matter that was personally disturbing to him. And he adopts a similar device with the middle-aged English Marlowe in Heart of Darkness. The other detail from that letter to Unwin, which I want to draw your attention at this stage, is his outline of the story. He says the following, uh, this is on the first slide, I think. The story is simple. There is hardly any description. The most common incidents are related. The life in a lonely station on the Kasai. I've divested myself of everything but pity and some scorn, while putting down the insignificant events that bring on the catastrophe. Upon my word, I think it's a good story. <clears throat> the Kasai is a tributary of the Congo. It begins in central Angola and runs into the Congo northeast of Kinshasa. For much of its length, it now forms the boundary between Angola and the Democratic Republic of Congo. What I want you to note in the passage that I've just quoted is that there's no mention of the characters or whose story this is. I want to think now about Kayats and Kalie. Early post-war criticism of an outpost tended to focus on the two Europeans in the story, Kayats and Carlier. Jocelyn Baines, for example, in his groundbreaking 1960 critical biography, describes the subject of the story as the rapid disintegration of two white traitors, average products of the machine of civilization, when confronted with the corroding power of solitude and the unusual. Similarly, Ian Watt, in his influential Conrad in the 19th century, states that the plot concerns two average lower middle class Belgians who go out to the Congo to get rich. An outpost of progress can indeed be read, as Baines and Watt, suge Watt suggests, as a sardonic, Maupasson like story which anatomizes the inadequacies of Kayat's and Carlier and through them mocks the idea of the civilizing mission. We know from Conrad's friend and collaborator, Ford Maddox Ford, that Conrad was a great admirer of Guy de Maupasson's short stories and knew some of them by heart. In 1904, he wrote a preface for a volume of Maupassant's stories, translated by Ford's wife, Elsie, in which he refers to his long and intimate acquaintance with Maupassant's work. In this preface, Conrad praises what he calls the austerity of Maupassant's talent, his refusal to be led astray by the seductions of sentiment, of eloquence, of humor, of pathos, and his unswerving singleness of purpose, his scrupulous, prolonged, and devoted attention to the aspects of the visible world. In An Outpost of Progress, Conrad presents us with two European men, Kayats and Carlier, one a bureaucrat, a government clerk, the other an ex-soldier. Conrad used the names of two of the Belgians he met in the Congo, and though Belgium is never named in the story, their names reflect the two main linguistic communities of which Belgium is composed, the French-speaking minority and the Dutch-speaking Flemish community. Kayats and Carlier are introduced as two perfectly insignificant and incapable individuals whose existence is only rendered possible through the high organization of civilized crowds. Note that word incapable. Note also that reference to the high organization of civilized crowds. Kayats has come to Africa to earn a dowry for his daughter. 
Collier has been sent to Africa because he'd made himself so obnoxious to his family by his laziness and impudence that they've shipped him out there. Their vision of their task is to sit still and gather in the ivory those savages will bring, as they put it. Both men are so institutionalized, so dependent on the support of a surrounding crowd of like-thinking men as to be incapable of independent thought or action. Thus, Ernst is filled with nostalgia for his life as a government clerk in Europe, and this is the next slide. He regretted the streets, the pavements, the cafes, his friends of many years, all the things he used to see day after day, all the thoughts suggested by familiar things. Collier is similarly, nost similarly nostalgic for his old life as a soldier. He regretted the clink of sabre and spurs on a fine afternoon, the barrack room witticisms, the girls of garrison towns. For both men, Africa is a void, a blank. The river, the forest, all the great land throbbing with life were like a great emptiness. That reference to all the great land throbbing with life carefully marks the narrator's distance from these two Europeans, for whom that great land is simply a great emptiness. If this latter is a version of the imperial gaze, dehistoricizing and erasing the human presence from the colonized landscape, then that gaze here is presented explicitly as the product of stupidity and laziness rather than an expression of power. The great emptiness of Africa in this instance very clearly reflects a lack on the part of the viewer. In the course of the story, there's one brief moment when Caius and Collier gain a sense of purpose. This is when they come across an article in an old newspaper about our colonial expansion. Its rhetoric allows them to briefly think better, to think better of themselves, briefly. And this is the next slide. It spoke much of the rights and duties of civilization, of the sacredness of the civilizing work, and extolled the merits of those who went about bringing light and faith and commerce to the dark places of the earth. We're conscious of the gap between this rhetoric and the character and activities, or lack of activities in this case, of the two representatives of the civilizing mission in this story. This is emphasized when Carlier tries to imagine the civilization they will bring to this particular dark place. Here, the inadequacy of his, of his imaginings serves to subvert their self-regard and the official rhetoric of civilizing work. He thinks, or he says, in a hundred years, there will be perhaps a town here, keys and warehouses and barracks and, and billiard rooms. Civilization, my boy, and virtue. Collier's vision of civilization exhausts itself after this brief enumeration of warehouses and keys, barracks and billiard rooms. His recent experience of keys and warehouses, which he must have glimpsed on his way to this outpost of progress, combines with his memories of the barracks and billiard rooms of his former life, for which he feels nostalgic. In the meantime, while they wait for the ivory to come in, they're almost entirely dependent on the friendship of Kabila, the chief of the neighboring villagers, and the food, food brought to them by his people, as the next paragraph informs us, and this is the next slide. In consequence of that friendship from Kabila, the women of Kabila's village walked in single file through the reedy grass, bringing every morning to the station fowls and sweet potatoes and palm wine, and sometimes a goat. The company never provisions the stations fully, and the agents required those local supplies to live. So far from bringing light to the dark places of the earth, Kayats and Carlier are shown to be parasitic on the existing economy and social organization of their African location. With the arrival of the knot of armed men, the slave traders from the coast, the imperialist rhetoric of civilized and savage receives a further knock. Their leader, we're told, stood in front of the veranda and made a long speech. He gesticulated much and ceased very suddenly. For readers of Heart of Darkness, the scene is purely reminiscent of Marlowe's speech with gestures to his bearers, with the significant difference, of course, that this speech is made by an African, and more importantly, is perhaps addressed by an African to Europeans. For Kayats and Carlier, the experience is inexplicably unsettling, and this is the next slide. There was something in his intonation, in the sounds of the long sentences he used, that startled the two whites. It was like a reminiscence of something not exactly familiar and yet resembling the speech of civilized men. 
The narrative has emphasized that Kayats and Cartier are psychologically dependent on the safety of the familiar, as we've seen as each indulged in memories of their former lives. Here, however, the discovery of the familiar in the unexpected is unwelcome, and the involuntary memory it produces is disconcerting. We might see this mixture of the familiar and the unexpected as an instance of what Freud calls the uncanny. More importantly, what Kayats and Carlier are experiencing in this moment is an undermining of the categories, the binary oppositions of imperialist rhetoric, which they've imposed on their experience of Africa. The contradictions they were able to ignore in their relations with the friendly Kabila are now inescapable. Where they felt able to dismiss the other Africans they've dealt with as savages and animals, the arrival of this particular group forces on them a recognition of authority and culture, which undermines their simple civilized savage binary. It's interesting that Carnier's amazed response to this linguistic performance is the observation, I fancied the father was going to speak French. Although he immediately turns to dismiss the leader's language as a different kind of gibberish to what we've ever heard, for a brief moment, he's forced to accept an equivalence between the two languages as languages and to experience a corresponding disruption of his expectations. I could continue further with this analysis of the story in terms of the two Europeans, their disintegration and their breakdown. But I want to use the entry of this knot of armed men to change the direction of this lecture. I want to start with the detailed description the narrative gives of them, which is the next slide. They were strangers to that part of the country. They were tall, slight, draped classically from neck to heel in blue fringed cloths and carried percussion muskets over their bare right shoulders. In his Malay fictions, Conrad describes the dress of the different peoples of the archipelago with an ethnographer's accuracy. I'm sure that this detailed description could be decoded by someone with more knowledge of the peoples of Africa to identify precisely who these men are. The percussion muskets are a major source of their power and authority. We might recall that Kurtz got the tribe to follow him because he came to them, quote, with thunder and lightning, that is, with superior weaponry. The Africans that ambush Malu's steamer upriver are armed with spears and bows and arrows. These strangers are carrying percussion muskets. Percussion muskets were introduced in the 1820s. They're distinctly old fashioned compared to the Martini Henry rifles carried by Marlowe's colleagues on the steamer. But nevertheless, they are a, a superior weaponry to spears and bows and arrows. As Conrad said approvingly in his essay on Maupassant, facts and again, facts are his unique concern. I want to argue in this part of the lecture that now opposed to progress is very carefully grounded in the cultural diversity of Africa, in just the way we've seen in the contrast between Gabilla's people and these armed strangers. In addition, I want to argue that Henry Price and his wife, not the Europeans, are the central figures in the narrative. Their ability to negotiate between and manipulate the different cultures of Europe and Africa is the pivot on which the narrative turns. Conrad's registering of the cultural diversity of Africa begins in the Price household. In this station on the Kasai, Price is from Sierra Leone to the north, while his wife is from Luanda in Angola to the west. Luanda, as it happens, is one of the oldest colonial cities in Africa, founded by the Portuguese in 1576. I'll come back to Sierra Leone in a moment. The first point then is that neither of them is native to this region. The second point I want to make is that in addition to this mixed household, the story involves four distinct groups of Africans, the local people from the surrounding villages, the men who arrived by canoe to trade, the armed strangers from the coast, and the 10 station men left by the director. As we've seen, the local people are represented as an efficiently functioning society. The women seem to be in charge of cultivation and relations with Kayat and Kale are determined by Kabila, the chief of the neighboring villages. Some attempt is made to represent Kabila's mental processes and the cross-cultural perspective is briefly reversed as the Europeans become the object of Gabilla's gaze. We are told that his manner was paternal towards these young men and that he seemed really to love all white men. At the same time, however, we're told that they are indistinguishably, indistinguishably alike to him. They are clearly as incomprehensible to him as he is to them. Conrad registers, registers the opacity of alterity for both sides in this encounter, but also the bond of affection that exists on Gabilla's part, at least. Subsequently, however, recourse is made to familiar primitive tropes to represent Gabilla's thinking, 
So as for example, we're told that Kabila believes that all white men are brothers and also immortal. This belief in the immortality of white men is not affected by the death and burial of the first European to man in the station, because he was firmly convinced that the white stranger had pretended to die and got himself buried for some mysterious purpose of his own, into which it was useless to inquire. As this suggests, he sees them as beings whose thoughts, actions and purposes are beyond his comprehension, and Gabilla's incomprehension of white people extends to granting them certain special powers. During the inquiry in Lord Jim, the Malay crewmen on the Patna similarly revealed that they thought that the European officers had some mysterious purpose of their own when they abandoned what they thought was a sinking ship. Secondly, Gabilla is entertained by Carlier striking matches and by Kayats letting him sniff the ammonia bottle from their first aid kit. Both of these entertainments are a version of the technological trope that's present also in Heart of Darkness, for example, in relation to the working of a steam boiler or the effect of the steamer's whistle. The strangers from the coast, the knot of armed men, are very different from Kabila's people, and very different from the men with spears who arrive by canoe to trade. These latter men are described as naked, glossy black, ornamented with snowy shells and glistening brass wire, perfect of limb. We're told that they moved in a stately manner and sent quick, wild glances out of their startled, never-resting eyes. They're clearly nervous in these surroundings, and they squat in long rows, four or more deep, before the veranda, while their chiefs bargained for hours with Makola over an elephant tusk. The strangers from the coast, as we've seen, carry firearms, not spears. They're not naked, but draped classically from neck to heel in blue fringe cloths, and they arrive on foot, not by canoe. Apart from these signs of their cultural difference, the most striking characteristic of these strangers is that they're not in awe of the Europeans. I've already referred to the speech their leader addresses to Kayats and Carnier. When it becomes apparent to him that they do not understand him, he addresses himself to Henry Price and turns his attention from the Europeans on the veranda of their house to the Price's hut. For the remainder of their stay, the two Europeans are ignored, and to the horror of Kayats and Carlier, these strangers generally made themselves at home on the station. The fourth group, the ten station men, had been brought from a very distant part of the land of darkness and sorrow. They were engaged by the company for six months, but have served for upwards of two years. They can't run away because as wandering strangers, they'd be killed by the inhabitants of the country. They're represented as having a different culture from the local people, which causes them further problems. And this is the next slide. Rice rations served by the company did not agree with them, being a food unknown to their land and to which they could not get used. Consequently, they were unhealthy and miserable. Where the company, in its provision of rations, homogenizes African cultures, Conrad's narrative carefully distinguishes distinct cultural groups. Where Caius and Carnia experience Africa as a void, the station men, like the local people, are represented as belonging to a functioning community. They were not happy regretting the festive incantations, the sorceries, the human sacrifices of their own land, where they also had parents, brothers, sisters, admired chiefs, respected magicians, loved friends, and other ties supposed generally to be human. The initial reference to incantations, sorceries, human sacrifices presents them as other and accords with stereotypical expectations and representations of the African as savage. But the subsequent reference to parents, brothers, sisters immediately breaks down the distance between them and the reader. The final words, ties generally supposed to be human, effectively thematize the issue of sameness and difference, and prompt the reader towards a sense of common humanity within cultural diversity. This is reinforced subliminally by the echo of the regrets of Caius and Carlier for their old life, which prompts an awareness of the similar nostalgia and homesickness expressed here. These Africans in Africa feel as homesick for their own distant community as the two Europeans. In short, where Kaitz and Carlier experience Africa as a void, a great emptiness, the narrative intimates that that space is actually filled with a range of functioning cultures and communities. And where the company homogenizes Africa, the narrative is careful to distinguish and differentiate a range of cultures. This brings me then to the place of language, or rather languages, in an outpost of progress. When Henry Price is first introduced, it's observed that he spoke English and French with a warbling accent. 
As an aside, it's not clear from this whether he spoke both languages or just French with a warbling accent. In addition, it's clear from the narrative that he must also speak or at least understand some African languages since he negotiates with the people who bring in the ivory or they have some kind of common language. When the armed strangers arrive, he's clearly anxious. He shows signs of excitement and left the storehouse in order to meet the visitors. But he also claims not to understand their language when questioned by Kayats, although he clearly has some understanding of it since he responds to their leader when addressed by him. And this is the next slide. This is the series of exchanges which follows. Hey, Mokola, what does he say? Where do they come from? Who are they? But Mokola, who seemed to be standing on hot bricks, answered hurriedly, I don't know. They come from very far. Perhaps Mrs. Price will understand. The leader, after waiting for a while, said something sharply to Mokola, who shook his head. The implication of this last part of the exchange is that Price understands but doesn't speak the visitor's language. Mrs. Price, for her part, however, both understands and speaks the language. We're told that the next moment, Mrs. Mercola was heard speaking with great volubility. And Price subsequently describes the visitors to the Europeans as traders from Luanda. There is again an ambiguity about this formulation, traders from Luanda. Does it mean that they've just come from Luanda or that they were originally, are originally from Luanda? Similarly, when they're referred to as from the coast, does this mean the West Coast or the East Coast? Would Luanda, Luanda count as very far from an outpost on the Kasai? The slave trade in Luanda was abolished in 1836, whereas the trade in slaves continued in Zanzibar until the end of the century. Tipu Tib, to whom Conrad refers in geography and some explorers, was the best known slave trader in Africa, trading slaves and ivory from the Congo to Zanzibar. Between 1884 and 1887, he was the protector of Zanzibar's interests in the Congo. And in 1887, with the Sultan of Zanzibar's permission, he was made governor of the Stanley Falls region by H.M. Stanley, a position he held until his retirement in 1890 or 1891. If the traders were born or based in Luanda, they could have spoken with Mrs. Price in Portuguese or in one of the Bantu languages, Kimbundu, Umbundu, or Kikongo. Mrs. Price's language skills, if they'd been listed like her husband's, would have included one or more of these languages, together with whatever was the language she shared with her husband. While Mrs. Price engages in dialogue with the strangers, Price seems to lose his linguistic skills. When questioned by the white men, this is the next slide, when questioned by the white men, he was very strange, seemed not to understand, seemed to have forgotten French, seemed to have forgotten how to speak altogether. The implication, obviously, is that Price at this point doesn't want to communicate with the Europeans. Because of the danger posed, posed, by this, posed by this group of armed men, he wants to exclude the Europeans from the negotiations taking place with the traders from Luanda. Through their linguistic skills, through the different languages they speak, Mr. and Mrs. Price can communicate with both these dangerous strangers and with the Europeans, and they can exclude the Europeans from the dialogue if they wish. I've been referring to this pivotal African character as Henry Price, but it won't have escaped your notice that in many of the passages I've quoted, he's referred to as Makola. Even the entry in the authoritative Oxford Reader's Companion to Conrad refers to him as Makola. The story begins by noting that the name Makola had been given to him by the natives down the river and had stuck to him in all his wanderings, but that he maintained that his name was Henry Price. The opening paragraphs also note, as I said, that he's from Sierra Leone, and the history of Sierra Leone supports his claim to the name Henry Price. Sierra Leone was established by the British as a homeland for freed African-American and West Indian slaves. The first settlement, Granville Town, was set up in 1787 by the London-based Committee for Relief of the Black Poor. The second settlement, the Freetown Colony, was established in 1792 for Nova Scotia settlers. The majority of these early settlers were Black loyalists, that is, African-Americans who fought on the British side in the American War of Independence and has subsequently lived in poverty in London or in the harsh conditions of Nova Scotia. Many of the Nova Scotia settlers were Methodists and they, set up an elect they also set up an electoral system in Freetown Colony that included votes for adult women as well as for men, considerably before this was done in Britain. After the abolition of the international slave trade in 1807, the population was further increased by what were called recaptives, men and women largely from West Africa, who'd been liberated from illegal slave ships. 
they were forced to adapt to the Western styles of the settlement and to adopt Western names. In 1827, the British established Fura Bay College in Freetown, the first Western style college in sub-Saharan Africa, and Sierra Leone became the educational center for British West Africa. After the Berlin Conference of 1884 to 1885, the British colonial government based in Freetown decided to recruit more British citizens for administrative posts and pushed the Sierra Leoneans out of these positions in the colonial administration. This created a diaspora of educated Sierra Leoneans down the West Coast, and Henry Price is perhaps part of this diaspora. When Henry Price is introduced at the start of the narrative, we're told that in addition to his ability to speak English and French, he wrote a beautiful hand, understood bookkeeping, and cherished in his innermost heart the worship of evil spirits. Given his Sierra Leone origins, it's possible that Price, like Marlowe, is bilingual in English and French, but doesn't speak any African language. The, arguments against, the argument against this last statement would be that Price's job is partly to negotiate with the men who bring in the ivory. The implication of the concluding part of this sentence is that a veneer of European skills covers over a deep-rooted Africanness. In particular, rather than the Methodism which was brought to Sierra Leone by the Nova Scotia settlers or the Christianity taught by Fura Bay College, Conrad describes to Price the worship of evil spirits. This again seems out of the toolkit of African stereotypes and actually has no function in the narrative. What I want to focus on, however, is that reference to bookkeeping which does have a function in the story. The way that Price is operating the story shows them negotiating between African and European cultures through a switching of languages, as I've demonstrated, but also through a performance of identity that draws on the resources of both cultures. That reference to Price's knowledge of bookkeeping is particularly important in this context. In the second section of the story, Kat and Carlier discover that the Price's dialogue with the traders from Luanda when negotiating an exchange of the 10 station men who are no longer able to work for a load of ivory, which would appease the director of the company on his return visit. Or rather, as Price carefully explains to Kayats, there was no exchange in the sense of trade. And this is the next slide. No regular trade, said Mokola. They brought the ivory and gave it to me. I told them to take what they most wanted in the station. Those traders wanted carriers badly, and our men were no good here. No trade, no entry in books, all correct. As Kayats realizes, Price has sold the station men into slavery for six tusks of ivory. He's also got rid of those dangerous visitors through negotiating this deal. However, what we see in this passage is more than just evidence of business acumen, to quote a quote again from the Oxford Reader's Companion. This dubious quality was clearly evident in his ability to make a deal. In this exchange with Kayats, he displays different skills. He uses his mastery of the discourse of accountancy and his understanding of imperialist hypocrisy to sell the deal to Kayats. He has to persuade him, as it were, that a party is really a working meeting. Or more accurately, he has to produce a form of words which will allow Kayats to persuade himself. We see the same discursive maneuver later when Kayats kills Carlier, and Price once again demonstrates his mastery of European authoritative discourses. And this is the next slide. After meditating for a while, Mercola said softly, pointing at the dead man who lay there with his right eye blown out. He died of fever. Kayats looked at him with a stony stare. Yes, repeated Makola thoughtfully, stepping over the corpse. I think he died of fever. Once again, Price shows his ability to find the appropriate terms to balance the books. Price's master of situations through his flexible negotiations between different cultures stands out in contrast to the incompetence and inflexibility of Kayats and Carlier. As the narrative shows, and as I've just suggested, an important part of his mastery of situations derives from his mastery of discourses. The dialogue between Kayats and Carlier, after the discovery of his trading of the station men for ivory, makes the, this difference clear. And this is the next slide. We can't touch it, of course, said Kayats. Of course not, said Carlier. Slavery is an awful thing, stammered out Kayats in an unsteady voice. Frightful, the sufferings, grunted Carlier with conviction. The narrator comments that they believed their words, but then undermines this and Carlier's conviction by adding sardonically, everyone shows a respectful deference to certain sounds that he and his fellows can make. The dialogue here is merely an exchange of tokens. Each says what the circumstances require and each thinks he means what he says. However, word price shows how he can use language and, and silence to suit his purposes. Respectful deference suggests that Kayats and Carlier are not in full control. 
As the narrative proceeds, they accept the ivory for the company and now have to find opposite arguments. It's deplorable, but the men being company's men, the ivory is company's ivory. They are shown here, I think, to be at the mercy of events and language, whereas Price is their master. The compromise they make here has an impact on them and marks a significant stage in their decline. After this, they have an inarticulate feeling that something from within them has, was gone, something connected with images of home, the memory of people like them, of men that thought and felt as they used to think and feel. Accepting this exchange of men for ivory has subtly but significantly distanced them from that sense of group identity that they used to enjoy. This process is completed after the shooting of Collier, when Kayetz comes to feel that he's broken loose from himself altogether. And this is the next slide. His old thoughts, convictions, likes and dislikes, things he respected and things he abhorred, appeared in their true light at last appeared contemptible and childish, false and ridiculous. The events of the narrative have broken Kayats free from a particular culture and a particular language practice, but have left him nothing with which to replace it. Since that culture and language constituted his identity, the end of Kayats' story is in a sense of foregone conclusion. As I noted earlier, the start of the narrative told us that until they were sent to this training station, Kayats and Cartier were two perfectly insignificant and incapable individuals whose existence is only rendered possible through the high organization of civilized crowds. The narrative had gone on, the courage, the composure, the confidence, the emotions and principles, every great and every insignificant thought belongs not to the individual, but to the crowd. Up until now in Africa, they'd been always in the midst of other white men under the iron guidance of their superiors. Us, on the other hand, has triumphantly survived the dangers embodied in the African slave traders and the political dominance of the Europeans through his knowledge of both cultures and through his instrumental attitude towards language, seen most obviously in his ability to use European discourses of accountancy and medicine to his own ends. Where identity for Kayats and Carlier was constituted by a particular language practice, Henry Price is involved in the migrant's constant performance of his identity through the continuous process of translating between languages and cultures. And I come now to my conclusion. Towards the end of the narrative, the narrator explains the delay which has left Kayats and Carlier alone together on the station for eight months, and we're told the following. One of the company's steamers had been wrecked, and the director was busy with the other, relieving very distant and important stations on the main river. This story of the wrecked steamer and the relief of stations on the main river is, of course, familiar to us from Heart of Darkness. As I mentioned at the start, Conrad wrote this in July 1896 and didn't begin writing Heart of Darkness for another two years. Something similar happens in Conrad's Lingard trilogy. Almeida's folly assumes the loss of Almeida's trading monopoly in Zambia, which is explained in An Outcast of the Islands, the second novel. And chapter two of An Outcast of the Islands, in providing Lingard's back backstory, refers to his first and successful fight with the sea robbers, when he rescued, as rumour had it, the yacht of some bigwig from home, somewhere down Karimata way. Rumour, of course, has got the story wrong, but this is the episode in Lingard's life that Conrad recounts in The Rescue. There's an interesting glimpse here, I think, into how Conrad's imagination worked. However, to come back to Heart of Darkness, in his 1975 lecture on Heart of Darkness, General Achebe begins by claiming that Conrad presents Africa as the antithesis of Europe and therefore of civilization. As we've seen in an outpost, Conrad is scathing about the imperialist discourse of progress and the civilizing mission. On the basis of this story, which was Conrad's first story about Africa, we can see that Conrad is very far from being, as Achebe alleges, the purveyor of comforting myths about European activities in Africa. Achebe also criticized Conrad in Heart of Darkness for presenting Africa through an antithesis of silence and frenzy. Again, even if this is true of Heart of Darkness, these are not the terms Conrad uses in an outpost. After this discussion of the representation of Africa, Achebe then turns to the representation of Africans. He refers to the presentation of Marlowe's African helmsman as one of Conrad's rare descriptions of an African who's not just limbs or rolling eyes. And he follows this up with the claim that it's clearly not part of Conrad's purpose to confer language on the rudimentary souls of Africans. As we've seen in an outpost, Conrad has presented Africans as much more than just limbs and rolling eyes and had not only conferred language upon them, but recognized the existence of numerous languages in Africa and the African's ability to switch between these languages. In Africa, as in the Malay archipelago, Conrad would have come across numerous people who, like himself, routinely switched between languages. 
As I've argued elsewhere, Marlowe's linguistic range is narrower than Conrad's and doesn't include any African languages, or Russian for that matter. And this has a significant impact on Marlowe's representation of Africans and African speech, or Russians and Russian writing in his narrative. In an outpost, Africa is certainly not a metaphysical battlefield devoid of all recognizable humanity. Africans are not dehumanized. They're not eliminated as a human factor. On the contrary, as I've argued, two Africans are actually the central characters. Perhaps it's the case, after all, that the narrative of Heart of Darkness is Marlowe's, not Conrad's, and that it operates within the framework, categories, and limitations of a fictional 19th century English sea captain. I've described the above criticisms as coming from a Chavis 1975 lecture, but they're actually from the 1977 article published in the Massachusetts Review. But even that's not quite accurate. My source is actually the 1987 amended version, which appeared in Robert Kimber's Norton edition of Heart of Darkness. Towards the end of his life, Achebe made the same argument in a Radio 4 broadcast. Disappointingly, in none of these versions of his critique of Heart of Darkness, does Achebe mention or engage with Conrad's first African story, An Outpost, which challenges so many of his criticisms of Conrad. This is particularly disappointing, since An Outpost of Progress might be seen as the context in which Heart, Heart of Darkness first appeared, a prior text which already established the framework within which Heart of Darkness was to be read and received. In this lecture, then, I've presented a positive account of an outpost and the disturbances that it causes. But there are some other aspects of the story that are disturbing in a different sense for the modern reader. I'm not talking here about the racist language and attitudes of Kayat and Carlier. They are what one might expect from men of their kind at this time and indeed is still to be found, apparently, in certain sections of the Metropolitan Police today. This is part of Conrad's critical presentation of them. I'm thinking, for example, of the narrator's occasional choice of vocabulary. For example, the initial description of Mrs. Price as a negress from Luanda, a standard usage at the time, but not something we would say today. Or the extended generalization about contact with pure, unmitigated savagery with primitive nature and primitive man, which comes a page later. Is this passage focalized through Kais and Carlier, or has Conrad again slipped into the contemporary mindset and language? It's interesting and perhaps significant that pure and mitigated savagery doesn't apply to any of the groups of Africans represented in the story. More worrying is the initial presentation of Price as cherishing in his innermost heart the worship of evil spirits. This is picked up subsequently in a reference to the evil spirit that rules the lands under the equator, and the statement that Price got on very well with his god. Perhaps he'd propitiate him by a promise of more white men to play with by and by. I don't know where Conrad has got this idea of the evil spirit from. As I've said, many of the inhabitants of Sierra Leone were Methodists. Similarly, the representation of the station men as regretting their native land where human sacrifices are listed as part of this culture. Like the reference to cannibalism and heart of darkness, is this Conrad slipping into lazy stereotypes, or is this Conrad using the stereotypes of Victorian culture as a bridge to his English readers? An Outpost of Progress was the first short story we know Conrad to have written. Ludmila Wojtkowska has pointed to what might be a related issue in, related, in relation to Under Western Eyes, where Russian readers are bemused by the stereotypical emphasis on Russian snow. Crime and Punishment, for example, emphasizes the heat of St. Petersburg, and are amused by the absurdity of Haldin wearing an astrakhan cap, which might be what English readers would expect a Russian to wear, but it's an expensive item that would have made him stand out a mile in the St. Petersburg crowd. Hardly ideal headwear for someone about to carry out a political assassination. And I'll end at that point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. I think that was um, a fantastic start to the first in our series on, you know, why we should still be reading Conrad in the modern world. And um, I think um, what we'll do now is we'll have just um, probably about a, a five minute break or so, and then we're going to come back. Okay, well, we've got um, half an hour to um, enter into some discussion and you have Roberts here in front of you and um, a number of other very esteemed Conradians from, um, from the Conrad world. So um, thank you all very much for coming along today. Um, Robert, I, I think what we'll do is um, I can just sort of read out some of the questions from the chat. So if you want to put questions in the chat, 
or if you want to kind of enter into more of a discussion, then if you use the bar at the bottom, the reactions bar to put your hands up, then um, I'll be able to see you because you're actually spread over two screens. Um, so I'll be able to, um, you'll flip to the top of the screen and then I can see what your question is. So um, I think Richard Mendel made a very good point that we still speak of Africa and Africans as homogenized one group of people. And um, I don't know if you want to comment on that, Robert. Um, I was going to agree with this. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, it is something that uh, that is still done. Except not in Heart of Dark, in um, Outpost of Progress, I don't no, think. So. No, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and Belinda uh, Gianessi, who I hope I pronounced your name right, how do Kayertz and Kalia perceive time and how that, how does that affect the narration? Are there any similarities with Heart of Darkness? I think that's a wonderful question, because um, I was focusing on the way in which they perceive space and how they perceive the space of Africa and the way in which they perceive it as a void or an emptiness. Um, I haven't actually thought about how they perceive time, and I probably need to reread the story from, from that angle. Um, oh, but also I'm willing to hear other people who've got thoughts about how they perceive time. That would be an, also interesting to hear if others you know, the, have suggestions about that. Um, I think I was so struck with the, the link, that kind of um, link between the two stories in that sentence, the link between... Um, outpost progress and heart of darkness that, that's the question of similarities with heart of darkness wasn't uppermost in my mind that i'm conscious of differences so that the way in which the narration is um through this ironic omniscient narrator rather than through embodied narrators i think that's a that's quite an interesting distinction and certainly i think that the conrad explores in those early fiction in those early short stories and early fictions is the, the different implications of using omniscient narration and using embodied narration. And so, for example, the way in which embodied narration allows you to say things which are always going to be provisional and are always situated, um, whereas omniscient narration obviously is a, claim to, is a claim to a mastery and a claim to being able to represent, particularly when you're dealing with different peoples, it's a claim to being able to represent the thoughts and the subjectivities of other peoples, whereas what you get among the problems, I think, that then Heart of Darkness has is that rather than making that claim to understand the subjectivities of other peoples, it presents the opacity of other people to Marlowe as a narrator who speaks English and French but doesn't have any African language. And so, for example, he has no way of relating to the intended because they don't have a shared, they don't have a shared language. So his representation of her is always a visual representation of her. Um, I think the other similarities would be in terms of the attitude towards the civilizing mission. Mm -hmm. um, the both are obviously very, very, very scathing of that, understandably, given Conrad's um, devastating experience in the Congo. Um, and I think related to that is a suspicion of some of the language that's used around colonization or to justify colonization. I'm thinking particularly of the savage civilized binary. And I think that his thinking about that develops between um, Outposts of Progress and Heart of Darkness. I think what he does in Heart of Darkness is a much more um, a conscious deconstruction of that, bi of that binary and of the black-white binary as well. Uh, whereas I think that he's moving towards that in an Outpost of Progress. So I think that the order of these two stories is quite important. And the to see an outpost of progress as the as I suggest in the context in which Heart of Darkness then is then to be read or to be positioned. I agree with you, Robert. I I wish that I had um, asked my level six students to read out of um, um, an outpost of progress before they read Out of <laughs> Darkness, and then perhaps um, we would have had a kind of slightly more nuanced discussion rather than, um, you know, the, the the very obvious discussions that we get um, yeah. now. So, yeah, Nick, it's, did you want to... Sorry, it's the text I used to start my course with was Outpost of Progress, mm -hmm. and then move on to Out of Darkness. Yeah, something I would definitely be doing in the future. <laughs> Nick. Thanks, Kim. 
Um, your repositioning of these two these two texts, Robert, is really is really interesting actually because I think if we as you as you have done if you if we begin from from an outburst of progress and then move on to try to understand what's happening there and then move on to kind of darkness that would actually I think uh, shed some light on on some of the some of the issues which kind of darkness deals with which which are perhaps um, more difficult to to see. Um, I was struck by the quote with, by Kayats. He says, his old thoughts, convictions, likes and dislikes appeared in their true light at last, appeared um, childish, contemptible childish, et cetera, et cetera. And this, I mean, this is straight out of Sartre. It's, 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 it's the nausea. This, I think this is, this is actually anticipating existentialism. This mm-hmm. um, this particular quote, and in the context of the of the of the of the tale as a whole, I think there are distinct absurdist, I would say, fairly characteristic, you know, characteristic absurdist elements in that story, mm-hmm. which would fit the existentialist kind of um, um, kind of base that I think that I think Conrad is bringing into that story, which is also is also present in Heart of Darkness, but not so emphasized because Heart of Darkness is doing other things as well. But I think that at the outpost is, is doing more that kind of um, existentialist um, questioning of certainties, mm-hmm. uh, including time, actually, funnily enough. Time mm-hmm. is, one of, is one of the things which, which is questioned in, in for example, in, in absurdist, literature so there is a sense of a kind of a kind of um, a timeless present there's a, a constant present which uh, which doesn't which doesn't develop which doesn't actually evolve into into kind of uh, teleological time in, mm-hmm. in in the absurd in absurdist narratives so maybe mm-hmm. that that would that so yeah I'm just thinking of of the existentialist kind of um, um, kind of so, Kind of um, direction which the outpost is is taking, mm. and and that that would explain also the fact that these characters don't have a character that they they're without character yeah. um, in the in the traditional realist sense, uh, as well as a lot, a lot of the other things that happen. Yeah, well, I'm grateful to you first of all for answering Belinda's question about time, or at least advancing that that uh, discussion about the nature of time. Because it is interesting to think about how, what t- what their experience of time is, and as you suggest, it is a kind of constant present. Because they're they're just sitting, they're just sitting there, waiting, sitting, waiting, sitting, waiting. Um, and when you talk about them being characterless, I'm then thinking about um, Les Granger, about the sense of the way in which that lead character there just drift, drifts through that, and it's very difficult to pin down a sense of his character in the same way as it's hard to pin down a sense of their character, and they're just they're different characters. It's quite difficult to pin down. But also, I think picking up that quotation is very is very interesting as well because that is such an important moment there that what he's what is actually being done in that sentence or what's being confronted in that sentence is a complete turning over of a whole way of thinking, a whole approach to um, to life, I guess. Yeah. So, thank, Nick, thanks for that. Catherine, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Robert. That was fascinating. I have all kinds of thoughts um, sort of ideas, as you can imagine, um, including some of the relationship between slavery and human sacrifice that's kind of really frequently made in sort of uh, colonial adventure fiction. Um, and there's a kind of, uh, yeah, I can, I, it, it's, I can kind of share some stuff with you about that, which I think is quite, um, yeah, kind of interesting about how that works. But um, I guess I was wondering if you could say a bit more about the, and this might help thinking about Belinda's question as well about time, the use of kind of print culture to imagine um, the space, because they don't, they kind of read some kind of, I think it's like a newspaper article or something. And they kind of, again, goes back to um, what Nick was saying about, they like read it again and again, because they only Mm. have like this Mm. sort of one thing. But I'm just wondering, so that has an impact on their relationship with time, where they're reading something that's out of time, but that they kind of use to imagine their future. So there's something kind of quite interesting going on there. But just more generally, as a short story, in Conrad's own sense, 
of the kind of print culture context for his story and how that then relates to the things they're reading and yeah I'd, I'd be interested to hear you say yeah that. yeah I was thinking of two different things though when you started talking about print culture because I was thinking about the newspaper that you refer to they found the newspaper with that article about um about the civilizing mission and that links back to Heart of Darkness and the statement that Marlowe makes about um, a lot of such nonsense was being talked at that time. And so there's, and we also know historically the way the use Leopold was making of journalism and journalists in order to get out the propaganda out the civilizing mission. Um, so the one strand that links these, links Heart of Darkness and, Nos as, and Outpost is precisely newsprint and newspapers. And obviously we get that again in Secret Agent. With a, in a different, but in a different area. Um, so there is an interest on Conrad's part in the way in which newspapers are being used to present a particular sense of what is going on, in, let's say, in, in, in Africa. And the difference between what is being said in the newspapers and what he knows is actually going on on the ground and what he shows something of in this story. But the other thing that interests me is that they also find some books. And these men are obviously not readers. Uh, then, and um, and what we get then is the interaction with these with these novels that they find, and the way in which they relate to them, a, a bit like the way you might relate to um, the archers, the days or to a series. So they see them as real people and discuss the situations as if they're real people. So that what Conrad presents us with in the middle of the short story is this kind of mocking of of the naive reader, uh, <laughs> or the naive reader of fiction. So there's something going on there. Uh, to uh, to the the sophisticated reader of fiction about the way in which naive readers read fiction. Yeah. Uh, so there's two different things operating in terms of print media. There's print media in terms of newspapers and what that relates to and the kind of political agendas. And there's something else going on about how do people read fiction uh, or how should people read fiction. <laughs> I think that covers. Does that cover? Yeah. Something? Thanks, Robert. That's fab. And I'd forgot about the novels, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. That's that's great. Thank you so much. But I like the idea also about the newspaper being out of time, that it's not yesterday, you know, who reads yesterday's paper, that uh, this is ancient papers, yeah. Yes, yeah. Thanks, Catherine. Um, Will Atkinson's put a, um, mm -hmm. a comment in the um, chat. Um, I can read it out, William, or if you want to say it. Um, would it be going too far to say the outpost to some extent neutralizes the unreadable unreadableness of heart of darkness and thereby enables us allows us to still read it is outpost thus a pretext or a pretext <laughs> right okay um i'm first struck by william's sense of the unreadableness of heart of darkness um that obviously needs a lot of pressing i think um in that I obviously know what he's getting out there, but the, the mere heart of darkness remains, still remains very, very readable. And um, I think as a piece of work, as a more sophisticated, more fulfilled, realized piece of work than Outpost, there are some, there's one passage at least in Outpost, which to me seems, um, I would I would send back to be rewritten, as it were, <laughs> if I if I could, uh, because it's, because it's not working it's not working in the text. It's that long discussion about um, that I quoted from about the effect of the confrontation with the primitive, and that seems that seems to be Conrad getting into a kind of discursive vein and forgetting he's writing a story for a moment, or that there's some that there's some kind of loss of pressure there. Um, so to go to other parts of William's question. Um, I think what I was suggesting, and I think what you were picking up on, Kim, is the way in which the outpost, first of all, the way in which the outpost can be used pedagogically as a prior text in relation to Heart of Darkness, as a way of then challenging some of the preconceptions about Heart of Darkness that's, that certainly Sergio students are likely to have by that point in, in stage in their education. Um, that a lot of them will still have met Heart of Darkness in the first year, but they will have met Heart of Darkness through a Chebi um, in the theory course. And um, what this does then, I think, is uh, open up Heart of Darkness to 
reconsider to reconsideration. And I think for me that the issue very much is the issue of the status of Marlowe as, narr as embodied narrator, which is something that Achebe rejects. And I think that's one of one of the weak points in his argument. Um, I think outpost as a pretext is also interesting in that I wasn't always conscious that outpost had come first because I because I'd read Heart of Darkness before I read Outpost. I'd always assumed that Outpost was Conrad, something that Conrad had written later. Um, and that once I'd realized it came first, and that allusion to what to what is the story of Heart of Darkness then also has a different effect. Or some of the things which I thought were echoing Heart of Darkness are in fact anticipating Heart of Darkness. Uh, so I think it's important. I think the I'm thinking of that chronology being important in terms of Conrad's writing career and what it tells us about ways in which Conrad deals with the problem, the issue of writing about Africa. Um, I think it might also raise questions about how Heart of Darkness would be received if we, if we assume, or if we can assume, that some of his readers would have read Outpost. Uh, so if some readers already read Outpost, they'd had some idea about the kind of attitudes that he was bringing to this fiction before they read Heart of Darkness. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a sense in which it, 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 it was then a pretext for some readers mm. that would point them in certain ways to read, to receive Heart of Darkness. Um, I'd be interested to hear more from William about what he means by pretext by his last word. Um, pretext, I found this rather intriguing because pretext means a text that comes before. Yeah. And you seem to be implying that it comes before it has a certain authority over what comes later, which is a reasonable approach. But like you, I came to Outpost after mm. the dark, so my own experience was different. But there's also the notion of a pretext, mm -hmm. a pretext to do something. Mm -hmm. So it's not only a text that comes before, it's also an alibi, justification. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, and this is the problem, that Heart of Darkness is difficult, so I call it unreadable. It's difficult to teach now. Yeah. There is this language which offends a lot of people. Yeah. So in a sense, the pretext is a way of justifying or, as I said, neutralizing, I'm not quite sure of the right word, enabling us to look at the text, look past the unacceptableness, the unreadableness of the text to see, to see it. Uh, I'm, it's more, I'm, I'm more kind of just interested in this whole notion of organization, of sort of what, when you teach something, what comes first? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was also, for next, for next to my teacher, Waiting for Godot, I think I really will have to be how close to progress first, or, or, or second, I'm not sure. But waiting <laughs> texts, so that works. Yes, yeah. What I'm also conscious of, and I'm holding back on, is the, that what I put it together with in that first class is something like Corain or Lagoon. Because mm -hmm. uh, Conrad is dealing with the same kind of issue there when he's dealing with in the Malay fiction about how to represent Malay peoples or, diff or the different peoples of, of the archipelago. And I think what he's again exploring there in various stories is the problem of dealing with that, um, with omniscient narration as against dealing with it through an embodied narrator and the kind of claim that you make with omniscient narration as against the what you're allowed if you're using a, a character narrator. So if it's an omniscient narrator, the language all is then referred back to the, the author. Although I would also argue that narratives are always a kind of performance on the part of the author. Um, and I think that that patterning of the use of omniscient narration or use of a character narrator is, is quite important in both cases for the ways in which he deals with the question of representing the other. Um, and there's a way in which it's kind of an embedded narrative in my Malay fiction book, which was to do with the way in which the omniscient no novels like Almer's Folly or, Out or Outcast um, go into the mind of, say, um, Babalachi, or they present Babalachi and allow him to give a voice to the, a different perspective. It, it gives the voice of the Sulu on the presence of the Europeans in the archipelago. But the danger in that is it's also claiming, the narrative is then implicitly claiming a mastery over the, over, and a knowledge of that other. Whereas if you then use a, an, um, 
a non-amnistic narrator, you use an embodied narrator, what you're then doing is presenting a staging of ways in which a European represents to himself and to other Europeans or herself and other Europeans that the otherness of the other. And that then comes with a kind of with all kinds of qualifications already built in, which I think is what Conrad is doing in Heart of Darkness. Thank you, Robert. I'm glad we have this recorded. I will go back and listen to that again. <laughs> um, Daphna, you had a question. I think you're on mute, Daphna. Oh, is this better? That's uh, Okay, yeah. thanks. First of all, yeah, I'd like to thank you. It was really brilliant, I think. And uh, I, I always use, um, I always teach uh, uh, an outpost before, before uh, Heart of Darkness as a way of diffusing the uh, Achebe attack that is, I know, I'm, is going to, to, to come. So yeah. I think that's a very good way of diffusing it. And, uh, and your analysis is uh, really fantastic. And if you're going to publish it, I'd, I'd really like to know about it so that I can relay it because uh, both to colleagues and to, to my students. There's something I'd like to suggest though, uh, in terms of the, um, the uh, relationship, the intertextual relationship that we have here between, between an outpost and the heart of darkness. Um, Makola seems to be um, a precursor of one character in Heart of Darkness, and that is the native who is standing with a gun, uh, uh, watching over the, uh, the chained uh, 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 laborers. Um, and uh, he is called, I don't have the text in front of me, but I think he's called in, the, in Heart of Darkness, uh, a civilized specimen or something like that. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact words, but he he's presented as someone who's been civilized, i.e. corrupted by mm. the Europeans so that he's actually working in the service of, of, of these uh, atrocities. Yeah. So um, in a way, Makola is a kind of precursor because he too... Uh, um, he has been quote unquote civilized in that he speaks uh, European languages and can do bookkeeping meticulously and everything. But he too, uh, uh, this type of civil of, of civilizing mission, if you like, uh, is also uh, what has corrupted him. Uh, and he sells his own people or people who are other people to slavery. So, in a way, these, this is another link between these two texts. Yeah, exactly. Because the person you're talking about would be a member of the force publique. Yeah. The, the people being used, as you say, to, to um, superintend, supervise, be involved in, complicit in those horrific, those horrific acts against other, yeah. other local Africans, other Africans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Civilised seem to have slightly different sense in both cases, because what I keep wanting to insist on is the kind of long history so that it was important to me that Luanda is established, what, in 1716, 17th century, or that um, in the case of Sierra Leone, it has such a specific history to do yeah. with yeah. Um, people who've been taken from Africa to America, been slaves in America, fought for the British and lost on the losing side in, this, in the, um, the war in America, and then have, been, have suffered poverty in Nova, Nova Scotia or suffered poverty in London. Yeah. So it's long before Windrush, there were, there were people yeah. who were um, Africans living in living in London. But even longer, I mean, even that there's an even longer history going back to when the Romans came in the in, in the start of Heart of Darkness. Those Romans yeah. aren't Romans; they're from North Africa. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they arrived before the English arrived. The English yeah. are, the, are the, the later colonists who. who yeah. <laughs> um, so civilized there is heavily ironic, as you say, the word civilized there is very heavily, heavily ironic. Obviously. Um, but it's interesting to think, I'm just trying to think about the skills that Makola has and the way in which he's got um, presumably English is his first English presumably is his first language. And I'm guessing that the, the French that he warbles is is his second language. Um, the but he has then um, picked up this bookkeeping, but he's a bent, he's a kind of bent bookkeeper. 
Uh, he knows how to fiddle the book. He knows how to fiddle the books. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't quite know where, to, where, where else to take that. I was trying to present that positively, positively as yeah. part of his um, <laughs> migrant's experience of having to negotiate between different cultures. But yes, you can see it from a different perspective in terms of what he what he's become. And it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I should say there was an earlier version of this published in um, one of Kreiker's volumes. Um, but this is now a much more expanded and revised version, so I don't quite know yet what to do with this. Thanks, Robert. Um, thank you, Daphne. Linda, did you have a question? Yeah, I mean, mine kind of follows on from Daphne's in the sense that it, it relates to the notion of, of irony in Conrad. It always strikes me that Conrad presents his characters um, with, with this biting irony, and yet at the same time, he cuts that through with an incredible humanity. So that even with a character like, characters like Coyotes and Carlier, we see why they're doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's Amazon at my door. <laughs> I'll go in a minute. Um, and I just wondered if this is a way of dealing to some extent with Achebe. Um, um, he, he doesn't kind of get Conrad's irony and he doesn't get that Conrad's being ironic. Um, and I, I see it with Al Mayer, I see it with Willems, I mean, all of these characters who are desperately awful people, yet Conrad has enough about him in his humanity to present these as people we recognise as part of ourselves. Yeah, I, I think what's interesting there is the, the bit I quoted about humanity, about, sorry, about pity and scorn, and he mm. uses similar language in relation to secret agent, but I think it's quite, that's quite important as part of his basic orientation towards these, these people he presents, that there is a lot of, I think that might also be part of the discipline that he talks about, in that there is, there's obviously a great deal of scorn for Carlier and Kayats, and to some extent for Macaulay, Macaulay as well, but there's all, there is also an understanding, I think, that, and that I think is where the pity comes in. Yeah, you've got Amazon. Thanks, thanks, Linda. <laughs> Catherine. Thanks. Um, sorry, I was just thinking about the the fiddling the books, which obviously gets taken up in in a different sort of way by in by Carey and Mr. Johnson. So obviously it's Mr. and and Macola is a precursor to Mr. Johnson, although perhaps a more sympathetically drawn Absolutely. yeah um, but I think just sort of thinking about what um Daphne was saying I think though thinking on to what happens with people like Mr Johnson um we also need to be a little bit careful about using that language of corruption through mm. civilization because it takes away a level of agency and I think to assume that people might not have known what they were doing in adopting European practices or using European practices tactically um, can create a kind of um, potentially a sort of risky valorization of particular modes, which of you know, or a kind of a myth of um, indigenous kind of the sanctity of, ind of a particular form of indigenous culture, which is exactly what happened in colonial practice at the beginning of the 20th century with the kind of use of um, indirect rule and so on, where you kind of said you can never be as cultured as us and therefore it's better for you to kind of, you know, sort of keep primitive culture so, and, and that people like McCullough and Johnson then become these figures of ridicule. So I think there's a kind of like, it's a really tricky, something to kind of, to, to think like that just needs a bit of sensitivity, I suppose. And the other thing I was going to say relating to that is that obviously there were indigenous populations on the West Coast. So just because people came from Sierra Leone, although Conrad might have been signaling that larger history, you may well come from Sierra Leone because you're from the West Coast of Africa or from Liberia because you're from there, not necessarily because you've been transported back. So I think, again, although inevitably the the mention of Sierra Leone in, invokes that history. The practicality is there were plenty of people who were not, you know, English speaking, North American, African Americans who were brought back by the Liberia yeah. Sierra Leone. Yeah, yeah. We don't know enough about uh, Price's background. Uh, I'm partly going by the name, but then obviously it was the practice, I think, even for people who've gone from Liberia to be required to adopt European names. So the fact he has a European name doesn't necessarily mean that he is 
from origin that his roots are in the West in uh, via the West Indies or his roots are via yeah exactly North like America yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think he's being ridiculed. I think ridicule would be the wrong word for, for prize. Uh, you know, to go back to what Linda was saying. Yeah. But, um, I'm thinking about that scene we get where he's sitting with his children after he's got rid of, he's sold the slaves, he sold them into slavery. And that's a, that's a wonderfully kind of mocking image of, there's a little kind of idyllic image of him sitting there playing with the father, playing with his children. But I think that's also mocking the sentimentality of that image as as much as it's kind of, or more than it's directed at Macola or yeah. Price because Price is he's he's um, surviving within this culture where he is not recognised within a, within within that whole Belgian operation. Yeah, yeah, no, I would agree. I, I, I guess I meant that it very rapidly gets taken up, like the, the figure of somebody like yeah. Macola or Price, then go, gets taken up in that way. And becomes Mr. Johnson. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I think we've got time, we're running a little bit over time, but just one more question. Yes, Andrew. You're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, yes, that was fascinating, Robert. I just had a couple of quick questions or points. I was thinking, trying to read the story back a bit into the lives of... Um, of the of uh, Kalia and Kayats. Um they're very interesting characters in so many ways, but not, not least insofar as they um, can be read so easily as um, homogenized Europeans themselves, mm. um, as if they are responsible for some homogenous European view. Mm -hmm. But of course, they. Um, we always talk in Conrad terms um, about Belgium as being you know, a small country with an enormous private fiefdom in the Congo and so on. But of course, Belgium in its own right is, is a curious European country, particularly at those times. I mean, it only seceded from unions with the Netherlands in 1831, was it? So it was a relatively new country. Um, it's a country that's defined by the two major differences in itself, the, the religious and to a degree, the political that is um, connected with that. So yeah. you have two men here who speak um, by birth, two different languages, and I can't remember, and I'm ashamed <laughs> not to be able to remember which language they converse in in an outpost of progress. We, we're not told. We, we, we're not, I thought we yeah. might, yeah, okay. Well, it's, it's curious because these two, and I, I wouldn't want to, make too much of this point, but um, it, it's a particular subtlety, I think, mm -hmm. that the two representatives of, of the European are themselves from what you could say is, is that it's not the most divided state in Europe, but the one which perhaps shows the biggest divide, certainly linguistically and politically of, of any I can think of off the top of my head at this time. Yeah. Um, and the other thing was that, um, uh, Yes, it's a sort of duplex society. You know, we talk about homo duplex, but this is a sort of yeah. uh, a country that's that's um, that's comparable. So my first question, and I'm almost finished, is is you know what do we think? Well, sorry, what do you think, Robert, about sort of reading backwards, if you like, in, into those lives, mm -hmm. in relation to the situation in which they find themselves? And mm -hmm. then my second question, this is much more, much quicker, is in terms of what. The, uh, what you've been doing in working on European reception. Mm. Was there anything you'd particularly like to say about the re reception of Conrad in Belgium? Right. As they <laughs> are the inheritors of these two particularly um, uh, um, terrifying books, I think. Uh, mm. Yeah. Right, there's two, two responses to that. The first one is, thank you for the comment about Caius and Cardio. Yes, it is fascinating. That's what you've got there as the European as the Europeans is a non non homogenized Europeans. Um, I'm assuming that they must be speaking French because Kayats would have to know French presumably to work for the company since it yeah. sounds of French as the language is the lingua franca within the company. Yeah. Um, the question about the Belgian reception is more embarrassing because the I'm very conscious that one of the gaps in the book is Belgium because my Belgian 
the person I signed up to do Belgium stopped answering emails after, at at a certain point in the process. Uh, so I'm the the it is a fascinating story. I'd love to know the Belgian reception, but unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that question. That uh, the person who was originally going to do that disappeared disappeared <laughs> in about 2019 <laughs> when yes. when lockdown started. So that's a story still to be told. Is the story yeah. of the Belgian reception of Conrad? I'd love to know the answer. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Robert. I think that was a really fantastic session and um, I'm very, very grateful to you for opening up um, the Conrad Lecture Series, um, which is in association with St. Mary's University. And the lectures will be running every month until um, July. And our next lecture will be with Professor Yale Levin, who is actually here. Um, I'm not going to embarrass her, but um, she's here. Here she is. There she is. And uh, she's going to be talking about becoming planetary, the emergence of alterity in Nostromo. Yeah. I put the link um, in the chat. You can use the same link um, to book your tickets as you did for this conference, for this lecture. Um, I'll also be adding a new poster with some more details about Yale's um, lecture. Um, on the Conrad website. So look out for that as well. And for the um, continuing lectures, we've also, um, we're gonna have a lecture from um, Professor Linda Dryden, who's also here today. Um, and also from Professor Catherine Baxter, um, who's here. So, and Professor Lawrence Davis, who's also here. So we've got a fantastic lineup and um, I hope that it's added to your Saturday afternoons. Um, but just once again to say, Thank you to everyone who's participated and uh, an especially big thank you to Robert um, for starting us yeah. off. Thank you. Well, Robert. thank you, Kim, for setting this up. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I didn't have time to do was to show this. This is the edition of Heart of Darkness that Achebe is writing against. Because it's the one that was read in, it's the one that was read by American undergraduates in, the, in, in this period. And it's edited by Gerhard and it has Heart of Darkness with the secret sharer. And it's about Conrad as being at uh, writing. It's a, he says it doesn't matter where it's set. It needs it's not. It's nothing to do with Africa. It's a psychological journey. 